Hi everybody, good afternoon. Apologies for the slight delay in starting. We had um, a bit of a tech issue, uh, but we're all good now and um, hopefully now we're no bumps ahead and we can start this, this afternoon's webinar. So I just wanted to say welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our talk um, about the Butzer project and building a Neolithic house. So um, before we start, what I wanted to do was just introduce um, your speakers today. So I'm Maddie Gilbert. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager at Wessex Archaeology. Joining me shortly um, to give the talk is Gareth Chafee, and he is one of our senior project managers um, in our fieldwork team at Wessex Archaeology. Um, I'm conscious that um, some of you might not know anything about Wessex archaeology and might not have come across us before so what I wanted to do first is just uh, give you all a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. So we are a commercial archaeology company and we're also an educational charity. Uh, we've been around for about uh, for over 40 years in fact uh, and essentially what we do is we help our customers who are mostly uh, developers um, to manage the impacts of change on the historic environment. So basically we investigate the heritage and the archaeology of a site. So for example where uh, a new housing estate might be being built or a new railway line is being constructed uh, and we record and analyse what we find and we make sure that all of that information is made freely available to the public in a variety of ways. Um, but it's not just digging up um, and just buried archaeology. As you can see from those images and the variety we have there, uh, we use a lot of different methods and also a lot of tech uh, to investigate sites which are also underwater um, or in, intertidal zones uh, and also lovely historic buildings as well. Um, now, as an ed educational charity, we have um, a great and dedicated community and education team um, and they do a lot of hard work to bring what we find to schools and local communities up and down the country so that people can understand and ed uh, engage with the past and understand a bit more about their local heritage uh, and luckily it also means that we can do a lot of nice things like this public web webinar today. So on to how it all works. So Gareth will give his presentation and then afterwards um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, you'll see on your control panel what you've got um, is this little box where you can enter questions where that arrow is pointing and feel free to um, ask your questions at any point during the webinar. That's absolutely fine in that little box. What we also have here where the second arrow is pointing to this icon is the raise hand I, um, button and if you press this it will send us a little notification that you've raised your hand and you'd like to answer ask a question. Um, so if you want to do that instead of typing it that's fine what we'll do is come round to everybody that's raised their hands as well at the end during the Q&A and you can ask your question live to Gareth. So the choice is yours there you can either type your question or you can raise your hand and we'll come to you at the end. So last thing is um, just before we come on to Gareth what I'll do is play you a lovely video which just gives you a little sneak peek into the project so far.
Great. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Gareth. And I'm hoping, Gareth, uh, can we, are you there? Can we hear you? Just test out your... Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, great. Okay. I will just make you um, presenter and um, Thank you. great. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thank you very much, Maddie, for in that introduction. And thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Um, I've personally given many, many talks over the years about archaeology. It's one of the favorite things I, I um, do for um, as part of my job. I've never quite given the talk just like this before. Um, I feel remote from everybody. I've always liked the face-on-face -face kind of interaction, but we'll, we'll do our best. So as Maddie said, I'm here to talk about um, the Butzer project, our work with the Butzer um, Neophyte house that they're building, how that kind of uh, happened, how, how Wessex archaeology became involved, my personal involvement in, in the project, and, and kind of where we go from here as a, as a, as a project. Uh, I just want to point out that this talk would normally be given in partnership with either Claire Walton or Trevor Creighton from Butts H and Farm. And in an ideal world, they would be here with us today um, sharing this presentation, but unfortunately that can't happen. So I wanna sort of draw your attention to their names and to thank them uh, personally for, for their contributions. Um, I may have plagiarized them somewhere uh, throughout the talk, but, um, but without this, their contribution, this talk wouldn't be possible basically. So, Without further ado, I want to start by introducing Butzer Ancient Farm. Now, some of you may or may not be aware of Butzer and what they do, or even where it is. So, um, I want to start by just showing a little video, um, which is a drone flyover. So here we go. This is Butts Range from Farm, which is a unique experimental archaeological site located in the South Downs National Park, immediately north of Portsmouth. The farm displays ongoing constructions of ancient buildings based on real sites, dating from the Stone Age through to the Iron Age and the Roman, Roman Britain, and finishing with the Anglo-Saxons. They also grow various prehistoric crops and keep rare breeds of animals, including pigs, goats, and sheep. If you haven't ever been, I definitely recommend it. It's such a wonderful, wonderful place to go. So I'm just gonna go back to my presentation. Okay. So the farm has pioneered experimental archeology span since it opened almost 50 years ago. The focus was to conduct experimental research, exploring materials, consumption of resources, time and technique. And this could mean building a new structure using traditional tools and studying the wear and tear on that building and therefore its lifespan. But the farm is much more than that as well. It's um, it's a not-for-profit company and it has a really heavy focus on education. Every year they have about 35,000 children visit the site and I think it's up to about 50,000, 45, 50,000 with, with um, kind of the footfall and adults. Um, so it's really fantastic place to, to visit. Um, the structures and houses, as I mentioned before, are based on archaeological evidence. And they so they have a Saxon house, a Roman villa complete with mosaic and a working hypercourse, several Iron Age roundhouses and a Stone Age area. This kind of place that is regularly shown up in, in films and TV shows. So I'm, if you've never seen it uh, in person, you may well have seen it on the TV. Now, how did we become involved? Well, large, largely because of their Stone Age area. They had this house. So this was reconstructed um, and a reconstruction that was built around five years ago. And it's based on excavations at a place called Slandigai in North Wales, kind of north of um, Snowdonia. Now, during the excavations, uh, a structure roughly around 12 and a half meters by eight meters was formed by post holes and stake holes. Some of it was lost by erosion, but it was largely agreed that it was interpreted as being consistent with the roof building. So at Butzer, they wanted to see build a structure like this to see if it was possible to build a structure with such small internal posts and whether that would actually work. Later, the walls were wattle and daubed um, and decorated. Here you can see on the right hand side of the screen, 
um, decorated using um, stars from um, uh, Chattahook over in um, Turkey. Now it did work, but it started to fall down. Uh, so Butzer were then looking to build a new Stone Age building to replace it. Now their immediate, their immediate thought was to search online and luckily they, they did because they found Wessex archeology span and they found our work on a site called Kingsmead Quarry Horton in Berkshire. Now Wessex archeology, span as Maddie mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, we, were, we are largely an our, our educational charity who inspire um, children and, and gen the general public through archeology. span That's our, one of our principal aims. And it was the hope of Butzer to create a strong, long-lasting building that would be a good example of what can be used in, using Neolithic technology. And they were really drawn to the exceptional examples found on an archaeological site in Berkshire. Um, they were drawn to it because it was thoroughly excavated and documented, and also because they were able to interact with the people who ran the excavations, i.e. myself, and excavated the building. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how this new collaboration and partnership has helped build the new Neolithic house on the site. Now I'm going to start by just discussing a little bit about the archaeology of from Horton just to kind of get a feel for the for, for what we're, we're discussing. So the site is located in the Middle Thames Valley right on the eastern ed boundaries of Boucher. Here you can see on the plan on the right the dot shows the location of the quarry immediately to the west of the M25 and Heathrow Airport and located between Staines and Windsor because in that kind of area. Now the site is a, or was I should say, because it's gone, uh, but the site was a sand and gravel quarry owned by Samix UK who supply aggregates to Britain's construction industry. And I'll also like to point out at this, at this stage that Samex also supported and funded all of the archeological works as part of their planning consent. So it's all, all paid for and all developer funded. Now, this is the site itself. We excavated on the site from 2003 to 2015. As you can see, it was 52 hectares of, of archaeology of multi-period phases. So the plan on the, on the left, all the black lines that you can see, that's all archaeology. So as the blue dot indicated, we have some really, really key features, including Neolithic monuments, as you can see here with the team sat on with this beautiful Mortlake pottery. Early Bronze Age ring ditches, as well as a uh, extremely rare beaker burial. Middle Bronze Age settlement, and which also included complete globular urns, as you can see in this like incredible early uh, Middle Bronze Age metalwork. There was an Iron Age settlement on part of the site, and we also had a Romano British settlement on the site, which also included this incredible Samian bowl. Now the site lies within uh, within the Middle Thames Valley, as I said, and development in this area over the last 60 years has revealed incredible evidence for early prehistoric activity. There's some really key archeological sites, which some of you may or may not be aware of. Just pick out the causeway enclosures, for instance, at um, Dorney, Eatonwick and Staines. There was ring ditches, Cursus monuments, such as the Cursus, um, Monument at the Stanwell Cursus at Heathrow Airport, which is basically the the thin line next to um, next next to Heathrow indicated here. But the landscape provides the backdrop for the recent discoveries at the quarry, particularly the early prehistoric evidence. And obviously, why, as you know, we're here to talk about houses. So, what stands Horton out from any other site in the country are our houses. Now. Evidence for the Neolithic buildings is in the UK is not common. Approximately, there were only 30 or so known. At Horton, we found four on one site. Four timber structures identified dating to the early Neolithic. They were spread across the quarry, as you can see. And we even have a, has a, have a possible fifth, which we refer to as a house void, which you can see right at the top of the screen there, which we think was a house, but then was decommissioned and then turned into, into pit depositions. Now we had two different styles of houses from the four. Two different types of construction. Two were the plank or beams, as you can see, referred to as Horton 1 and Horton 2. And then also we had the two earth fast post structures, 
referred to as Horton 3 and Horton 4. All of these structures follow a similar pattern based around six posts. And that's important for when further later on in the talk. So a little bit of um, background information on all of the different houses. So Horton 1, found in 2008, measured nine and a half meters by six and a half meters, and was incredibly well preserved despite a modern pig farm being located directly on top of it. Internal partitions divided the area into two spaces, as you can see. There was slight suggestion of um, rotten timbers in gullies forming walls, vertical planking. It was slight, but we, it was there. The evidence was there. And artifactually, we had um, fragments of plain bowl pottery, uh, Langdao axe fragment, ax fragments, and these lovely worked bone ores that you can see in the bottom right corner. Horton 2, strikingly similar to Horton 1 in the plan, found in 2012 and almost identical floor plan. Here you can see the same rectangular shape with the same internal divisions. This was 15 meters in length by seven and a half meters wide on average, with a suggestion of an entrance in the southeastern corner. So basically the north uh, eastern corner, the top right corner of the, of the plan as you see it. The finds uh, quite a little bit more abundant than Horton 1, this time with a fair amount more of the plain bowl pottery. Also some rubbing stones that you say, see in the middle, but this time we also had some shaped arrowheads, broken arrowheads and, and tips. So more of a kind of domestic refuse. Horton 3 and Horton 4, less artifactually interesting, if that's to be polite about them. Horton 3 on the left here, um, was featured four deep post holes in the center. And in plan is near identical to one of the Lismore Fields houses located in Derbyshire. It's quite remarkable how similar the houses are and um, brings up questions of trade and contact and things like that. Horton 4, as you can see in the bottom right, was the least well-preserved um, structure on the site. It was recognized on site, but not recognized as being early Neolithic. And it wasn't until the post-excavation stage where we kind of really identified it as being that period. But it did contain quite a wealth of early Neolithic pottery and flint. Now we have secure radiocarbon dating from three of the four houses. They date to the mid to the late fourth millennium BC. So around 3,600 BC, to about 4,000 BC. And they're largely contemporary. Uh, as, a, as archaeologists were looking and were fi finding these houses, but one thing we want to know is how contemporary they are with each other. Are there one group moving across the landscape? And then we've seen that they're, they're largely contemporary. They're roughly three generations apart, moving from house to house. The gully constructions, inter interestingly, predate the postage structures. And the houses also predate monument building in the Middle Thames Valley. So that includes the cause with enclosures that I referred to and the Cursus monument. So we're really talking about a time when the landscape was beginning to open up, be settled in and be changed. So these are various house examples. As I mentioned, there's about 30 or so in the country. And you can see that some of them are quite sketchy. Some of them are quite big and vast in terms of the posted structures at the bottom. But you can also see how the Hortons, particularly one and two, up in the top left hand corner, are very, very fine examples of Neolithic houses in this country. And it kind of, again, sets Horton a little bit further apart from others. And there's often a discussion in archaeology about when does a house become a hall? And this is just literally looking at the length and the width. Here you can see the red dots shown as the posted structures, the earth path past posted structures I referred to, and the black dots being the gully construction. And you can see Horton 2 is right out there as being the biggest of this kind of gully construction located in this country, Horton 1 not far away. And I'd also like to point out, I don't have a photo of it here, um, but I'd also like to point out that we found another gully constructed, uh, gully, gully constructed house in the same rectangular plan with the internal divisions, about three kilometers to the north on a site called Riding Court Farm at Datchet. Um, so again, use of the landscape, different groups moving around, interacting with each other and building these incredible buildings that we're finding. So how does all this relate 
to Butzer. So in our discussions with um, predominantly Claire and Trevor from Butzer, we had a discussion about which one we were going to build. We had a, obviously had a choice of four. Now it was agreed to go with Horton 2 simply because it was the biggest. Now, easier to build, potentially, not quite so fiddly, but also from Butzer's point of view, the biggest available teaching space and the space to be able to use um, within the farm. As you can see, there, it's not a regular rectangle. There's a slight taper on the eastern end on the right hand side of the page, which is significant as to how the build process developed further down the line. Now, measurement wise, like I said before, it's about 15 meters in length and on average is about seven meters in width, but you can see the different ends. You'll also note the both ends have these slight inwardly curved and inwardly bowed forms. But being a relatively clear archaeological footprint uh, helped us. There was evidence of vertical timber walls again in this house as, it, as we had in Horton 1, but this, this time it was very slight and it was located predominantly on the eastern end. And some foundations were up to one meter in depth. And again, we had very few post holes, only one at each corner and two internal as well as the dividing wall. Now this building as such, as such represented a challenge in terms of construction. The challenge in that it only had six post holes. There were no internal supports other than this internal division. We also noted a potential doorway on the southeastern corner prior to the excavation, and then this was confirmed during the excavations. Now, as the project moved forward, there were two main aims before we even set about rebuilding this, this uh, building. We must, number one, we must be faithful to the archeological record at all times and the excavated footprint of the building. Otherwise, we'd just be making a Neolithic building, a Stone Age building. This time we wanted to be absolutely clear that we were building Horton II. And number two, second aim was that only tools and knowledge available to the Neolithic people would be used during the project. So looking at other, Neolithic house representations a little bit. Um, reconstructions and reconstructed buildings are relatively common across Europe. Um, mostly of them are going to be based on archaeological excavations. So, and most of them will be the, of this longhouse form. The image in the top left, for instance, are old post buildings. Experimentally, you can understand how posts support walls and a roof. It's clear how you would work, how that would work as a piece of engineering using simple carpentry but not necessarily archeologically. You see from the image on the left, there's a suggestion of the post holes, then that would translate to this building. But also you see, you look inside and think, well, that's not a particularly practical space. There's a post every couple of meters, like not enough room to swing a cab effectively. So how useful would that be as a building? And almost um, potentially, then there's an assumption that all of those posts are contemporary with, another, with one another, that they don't represent different phases, that they were all built at the same time. But as you can see, it's not the most practical space. It's clear how it would work as a piece of engineering using simple carpentry, but the large number of posts could support a heavy row, roof and possibly even a second floor in some cases. So you see a lot of these reconstructions have this kind of similar issue of internal posts with a roof on top and vertical walls. Now Horton II is very different averaging seven meters in width, but it only has the internal two posts. Now these constructing buildings all have common traits. They all have vertical walls, they all have thatch roofs, and including clandy guys. So these are reconstructed examples from around the country. Um, but you can see there's, a, there's certain elements that are the same. And some are very ex extremely neat and tidy. Um, some are a little bit more shaggy, a little bit more kind of unkempt, but you can see the kind of, the difference in people's reconstructions of such buildings. And certainly even the Wessex archaeology version from that we um, digitally created in 2013 had the same features. We went with vertical planking walls. We went with a turf roof or a thatched roof with internal features. So we went with a mezzanine floor because the, the archaeology potentially suggested there was a mezzanine floor. You can see the wattle internal divisions creating the two spaces.
and we have to say that buildings like this you we are making general assumptions about the archaeology the image on the right that's what we found we found that floor plan archaeologically and we found some holes in the ground we found no supporting structures so we have no idea exactly how this building looks so the search number one assumption is that the structure is a house potentially the the structure could have been used for animals now prior to any excavation we undertook phosphate analysis looking for animal um animals but we did find associated domestic refuse such as pottery and flint tools so we can assume that we can make the assumption that it's a house we also made the assumption that it had a roof and the roof was thatched potentially turfed so if we take this simple design very very simple design with the vertical walls represented by a square and the roof by a triangle now that roof with the thatch and the supporting timbers would weigh around 10,000 kilos and is trying to push the walls apart and collapse the building, which means that the walls need to be pulled together and tied together to stop the building collapsing. So a lot of the reconstructions would have this similar issue, but with internal posts and internal um, support for that roof, it could work. Now at Horton, we didn't have that, we didn't have that luxury. We only had that um, outer boundary. So what if we chose not to build all the walls in the same way? And what if we chose not to build a box structure? So if we remove the need for the internal supports and we take away the walls, leaving a very simple structure, essentially a triangular structure, an A-frame structure. Now the triangle, triangular shape copes very well with wind and earth, and the earth itself ties the two sides of the building together. Other things to consider, at the roof angle. Now, butts are definitely the specialists of um, thatch roofs and on um, reconstructed buildings. And they know, and they told us, that the roof angle has to be at least 45 degrees. And this is required for the roof to be waterproof. And it determines the shape of the roof and ultimately the shape of the building. Any shallower in the thatch's ability to shed water is compromised. So the final design that we basically came up with working within the real space in our this is one kind of contribution that wessex archaeology could to bring to the table is our technological expertise and our specialists by putting in this a-frame you following the width of the building including the taper um with the vertical supports including the internal division which you, as you can see so this began the process of actually starting the build now it was decided that the Flanderguy building, as you can see here, was to be demolished and the new build to be built exactly on the same in the same footprint. So the task of decommissioning the old building began, removing the wet, soggy thatch, as you can see the difference between the, the old and the new thatch. The wattle had come off and the, then the turf was started to come off the roof as well. You can see as the decommissioning process continued, now this is very clearly, and I'd like to point out that it, even the decommissioning of buildings is part of the experimental process. So the, as archeologists, we're looking at how these buildings, the imprint that they left on the ground once they've been removed, how long they will take to um, decompose, et cetera, et cetera. Now, much of the material, particularly that from the wattle, was stored and is being reused around the farm and some of it even on the new build. So you can see now the, the, the building is completely demolished. Now I'm just going to show another little video. And hopefully you can hear this sound. So flint tools were used in the process of making this. As I mentioned before, no power tools were used. The tests were conducted to demonstrate that all the joints and features could be used using a ne essentially a Neolithic toolkit. Flint axes of different shapes and sizes were used as part of the experiment. I just got one more video to show you. Yeah, we're getting there, but this one you can really give it a good wall up, and I don't seem to have done anything to it yet. Yeah, those metal tassels will be really good because they've got that. Whack it hard. End. Yeah. <laughs> These are hard, like this is this they... is showing that 
that video is showing that you can use authentic tools to create the building. So you saw flint tools being used um, to cut the wood. And that second video, you saw holes being bored using bone bone, and only using animal bones. Um, now, it was also really important for me, who ran the excavations for seven years at Horton, to then eight years later to get a phone call uh, to say, we're going to build the house that you, you found. What I found um, to be really key to that is to introduce the people who actually excavated the building. Here you can see two of the chaps here um, in the orange trousers on the right hand side of the screen, particularly Andy, uh, the one to the left, who excavated. He was one of the main excavators of the house in 2012. It was really key for those people who worked on the project and excavated the house um, that they went to help with the build. And despite being specialists and professional archaeologists for, for many years, and for many of us, it was the first time of actually using flint tools on wood. So, like I say, it was a fairly low tech um, approach. So we were jacking up frames on a simple scaffold frame. Here you can see the scaffold frame in the in the center, this kind of simple A frame. Lots of hauling on ropes and lots of levering these A frames into position. All were installed without the use of a mechan mechanical crane. Now the construction was formed by round timbers, but with simple lap joints to create a nice flat surface where timbers meet each other. Um, and five A-frames were installed. Now, we only had evidence for there being uh, three posts, as I mentioned, the, around the six posts. But in this day and age, we've got to make the building safer. So it was going to be a seven meter span without any kind of supporting posts. So we had to put in five. Now, around seven tons of Scott pine, Scott's pine have been used. Now, this is kind of critical that we used wood that was available in the in the Neolithic period, and we have environmental evidence to show that this was the case at Horton. And on top of that, there's about 600 kilos of hazel have been used for these horizontal battens or purlins to support the thatch. The building is primarily held together with cordage, as well as being pegged together with the oak pegs, as shown before. Um, to provide lashings holding the rafters, purlins, and battens securely in place. In the Neolithic, it may have been possible to source material like the bark of a lime tree and soaking it or retting it, the stripped fibers in water over a period of weeks um, to produce useful, flexible fibers. But the cordage on the house here is using a natural plant fiber called sisal. To date, around 5,000 meters of cordage have been used for the thatching, lashings, and main structural joints. So you can see it's a very, very intricate process. And on the image on the right, as you can see, there's the combination of the rope, the cordage, and also in the center, the pegs. So you can see that there's no, no nails, no hammer, like metal hammers being used, no power tools being used. Now, the other one of the interesting things that came out of this approach, um, actually, to sort of take a step back and look at the frame to see this distinctive curve along the roof line as it sort of dips towards the east. This is an inevitable product after following the differing widths throughout the building whilst maintaining the 45 degree angle pitch to the roof. Now, this uh, profile is often referred to as a hogback profile produces a strong shape and is similar to medieval buildings in Scandinavia, such as this kind of reconstruction of a Viking longhouse. Now, this is a possible architectural design for strengthening, strengthening purposes, and we may have inadvertently stumbled across this, or may it, it may be a happy coincidence, but the hogback is purely a result of mirroring the archaeology and the tapering building footprint. Now, one, another, like I mentioned before, Wessex Archaeology are able to provide a techno technological expertise to the project to give us different um, options. Here you can see in the background, um, over in the corner, there's some lots of survey techniques going on. We're video and filming every single stage of the process. But this image was taken from one, one of our drones. Now, we had a day out there in uh, out on the site in December or January, I can't remember which. Um, to actually take lots and lots of photos. Now this technique of called photogrammetry uh, basically stitches together hundreds of photos um, to create a 3D model, which I'm gonna show you now.
So this model will ultimately be used to create an interactive virtual reality model. Um, it's a way of um, using the technology as an educational tool. So here we can see it was important to get a model of the, the building at its skeletal stage before the thatch went on. So we've got a, almost like a before and after. We will also take a, a 3D model like this once the house is completed. But it's really, really important. So you can see eventually we'll be able to kind of share this stuff online for people to interact with, create the virtual reality space. So you'll be able to put on the VR goggles, walk into a Neolithic building, interact with the things inside, walk outside of the building and go and interact with a, a, a Neolithic landscape around you. On the thatch side of things, um, so Horton 2 was built near a wetland in Neolithic in the Thames Valley. And it's assumed that the builders would have good access to water reed from wetlands, which is an excellent roofing material for thatch roof. Water reed can last up to 30, uh, sorry, 50 years. This uh, thatch came from a source in Eastern Europe um, and it was hand cut, which will give it a much more authentic appearance. Now the thatching is, it was estimated to take around 80 person days um, and it was completed largely by lots of volunteers and staff. Now it's not yet completed. I think there's about 60% has been completed to date. You can see it's got a very time intensive process, but ultimately it's creating layers that are about five, six um, layers thick to create a really good watertight seal. Now the ends, we made a decision as a group and as a team to make take the opportunity to build the two ends in different ways, all in the interest of experimental archaeology. So the western end, as was shown here, was decided to make a wattle and daub wall. Here you can see like the the vertical stakes. Now this was also really important for Wessex Archaeology as a company. Um, basically, the company offered twenty staff the opportunity to to visit Butzer and be involved in the build. And that was from office staff through to illustrators and all in the interest of kind of health and well-being days. For, and it was an opportunity for skill sharing, networking, and for the good, good for med, mental and physical health, particularly for those who may not otherwise work outdoors, carry out manual hands-on tasks, et cetera. Now, rather nicely, this wall has been dubbed the Wessex Wall by Butso. Now, the upright staves were wattle weaved in around them to create the wall were then filled with daub, which is a malleable fill made partially from animal poo, normally cow manure, mixed with the soil or sand and something um, to strengthen it like straw or hair. Now this is pushed or forced into the wattle structure. Now when this dries, it will quite create a nice watertight feel. Now this, as I mentioned earlier, the Door was largely reconstituted from the Landigai house that was there on on, uh, this, uh, on the previous building. On the eastern end, however, we made a decision to go with these split vertical planks, which is ultimately a nod to the archaeological evidence I referred to earlier. The, the doorway and porch mirrors the excavation in being on the southeastern corner of the site. This is a feasible interpretation based on the archaeological evidence but it is an interpretation. Experimental archaeology uses is used as a means of understanding what could have happened in the past and not necessarily a way of categorically defining what did happen. And I think that's always been part of our discussions that this is just one interpretation of what the house may have looked like. Ultimately, we've already come up with about five or six different ways that this house may have looked. Um, and that's ultimately part of the discussion further down the line. And as certainly as an educational tool, as as archaeologists, we go from holes in the ground to an upright structure. So, and then we are making educated assumptions as to how this building may have looked. Some more detail of the roof. Now, the project does has as does have its experimental compromises. For instance, there is no evidence in the archaeology for slanting posts. We have also have modern limitations. Believe it or not, the house has to go through planning. There was a height of the building was restricted to only five meters. So the house that we really wanted to build and the, the star that we really wanted to build as a group would have been over seven meters high. So we had to kind of, we had to change that 
And we also had, to, as I mentioned earlier, we also had to include additional posts and a larger doorway to comply with planning regulations. But the build did justify experimentally that the building could be built with Neolithic technology, albeit in our admit admittedly basic way. And there is experimental value to the building. The ground plan was carefully followed, built by a relatively too small team and no machinery or power tools were relied upon. I should point out that on occasion, power tools were used, but only for the convenience of the, of the team building it and only after other techniques would, were confirmed experimentally because the, um, the building ultimately had to be, well, they were on quite a tight um, build uh, timeframe. This is the last image I have of the house before um, COVID-19 um, came into our lives. As you can see, it's an imposing structure and evidence that Neophyte builders had the ability to engineer solutions to major problems in the building. Now the pandemic shutdown has um, meant that the, the build has ceased for the moment and the farmer has closed for the time being, but work will resume as soon as possible. As I mentioned, this is an incredibly personal project for me. The, the photo in the top left here was the first ever photo taken of the house. Um, one morning, one spring morning in 2012, probably one of my, my favorite mornings in archeology, span just it was myself and the machine driver and I, I discovered this house. And then after the tea break, called the guys over, as you can see here, to take the photo. But then to get a, an email and phone conversations eight years later to start the process of building the house that I found, incredibly personal and to be, heavily involved in the discussions and the builds um, has been absolutely fantastic. It's a truly collaborative project, which is bringing out the best in the two companies. And we're truly forming a collaboration and a partnership that will hopefully last for years and years, not just in this one project, but in many more builds in, in the future. So as I said, the, hopefully the, um, the build will be completed in autumn. I just put maybe because we obviously don't know when we're going to be able to get back onto the site, but hopefully we'll be able to get that back there soon, finish the builds and get this open up to the public so everyone can come and visit the site and see this incredible building. Just uh, before I finish, there's a little bit of um, information to share with you. So both um, Wessex Archaeology um, have an awful lot of information on our website. We have um, and we also share information, but so produce um, weekly blogs of the project, which are absolutely fantastic to read. Um, gives a huge amount of information far ab above and beyond what I've discussed today. And I'd also like to draw your attention to a series of videos that are being created between Wessex and Butzer, all on YouTube and all located, and you'll also be able to find the links on, our, on the Wessex Archaeology website, basically taking us through step by step in small form. So the first video is myself talking about the archaeology, the second part talking about um, the, the construction and the experimental structures, and then there's some fantastic videos um, by Trevor explaining the, the, the design construction um, and the compromises that we had to make as a group. So thank you very much. Stay tuned throughout 2020 for a little bit more information about the build. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Gareth. Um, so as I said, we are going to do a, a Q&A um, session now. Um, so thank you very much to everybody who's already asked their questions. Um, so we have um, a few um, already sorted so um robin um this was something you did touch upon um gareth but um robin just asked about um how how did we manage uh the building regulations like fire safety and structural integrity um and health and safety and all of those things um during this build do you could you give a kind of comment on that i i can give a brief comment on that in that mm. i i wasn't involved in that part of the process <laughs> uh, i know I'm aware that the planning um, regulations did come into it. Um, so the one I'm definitely aware of is the height restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. That was all part of it. I mean, certainly the the the, the guys at Butzer would know far more about that. I know the the doorway, for instance. I mentioned I did mention that had to be significantly wider than we found in our excavations for wheelchair mm -hmm. access and, and 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 things like that. Um, 
in terms of the yeah. fire eggs and things like that i couldn't i couldn't comment on that because i don't know the, the details on that but i know that they they have been working very closely with with the council um mm. and with the, the planning authorities to to produce this yeah exactly because it's where it is worth remembering that at the end of the day after this build it has to be a kind of living breathing building that's an educational space for lots and lots of visitors so there will be a huge amount of um exactly that i mean ultimately they're estimating that they could probably fit about 100 children in this one building um once it's completed it, it is massive I, I didn't really talk about the size but when you the feeling of when you're standing inside of it it is vast building so mm. absolutely there, there's going to be boxes to, to be ticked um and to make sure that it's it's following the the regulations to the letter Amazing. So um, thank you very much for that question, Robin. Um, next question is from Ali, who says, um, were there hards inside the houses that you excavated? And if so, where were they? So thank you for that question. Um, unfortunately, uh, we didn't find any floor surfaces or hards in any of our buildings. Um, the sites where we excavated them at Horton had been heavily ploughed for centuries. Um, as I mentioned, the Horton One, there was also a modern pig farm. It was remarkable that we had such good preservation that we did. The, the one thing we did do on all of the house locations was magnetic susceptibility um, study and look and phosphate analysis. So those were trying to pick out things like hards. Now on Horton Two in particular, we didn't find that, but actually prior to the excavation, we found the hot spot, if you like, on the doorway location. And then excavating it, and that essentially that's where we found the doorway. So effectively, found we found sweepings out the door that had got trapped in the gully construction, but unfortunately the hearth had gone. Now the buildings, all of if you've ever been to Butser, you would know that all of the buildings have fires inside them. So the intention is to light a fire in them in these buildings, and it will almost certainly be on the western side, so the opposite end of the doorway, if you like. Um, but unfortunately, no, we didn't archaeologically we didn't find any evidence for hearths. Mm, great. Um, so next question, this one comes from Vicky. Um, so she says, um, was there any evidence at Horton to suggest alterations or rebuilding of any of the houses? So she says, we found this, oh, forgive me, I don't know how this is pronounced, <laughs> but I'm going to try. She said, um, we found this at Lanfethlu on Anglesey, <laughs> as well as different building materials and techniques used on a single building with one end battle and one end plank built. Um, again, a, a really good question. There was only one example that I can think of from our four houses, and that was on Horton One, when during our digital reconstruction, we kind of tried to remove ourselves archeologically from what we were looking at just look at the holes and think architecturally. Now, in one case, there was a suggestion that one corner had been, and there were post holes that didn't quite fit, but they looked like they were there as a um, as a, um, a supporting structure, if you like, kind of rebuilding maybe one corner. These things appeared to be quite short-lived, um, so there's not no direct evidence for alterations or rebuilding, unfortunately but there are little hints, if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, next question is from um, Lyndon, who says um, he's um, studying the uses of lime trees. Is there any evidence for the use of cordage to fix these structures? Is there a reason you chose to single out lime bast? Not sure if that's uh, one no, that I, we can. <laughs> no, I, I just mentioned lime um, uh, lime trees as a, an example of where, in historically in in, in Neophyte, they may have got this cordage from. I mean, cordage is used um, very very heavily at Butler. It's a shame that we don't have Claire here to explain a lot more about the reasons behind that. Um, mm. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I, I I can't give much more detail on the on the on the cordage, but. Um, I think that's a that's a question that we'll certainly be able to pose to to Butzer and put in one of their blogs. I, actually, talking about their blogs, they do have um, Claire's discussions in her blogs do refer to cordage quite a lot. So I know that mm -hmm. there's a there's a one blog in particular that was worth looking at that would discuss discuss cordage. 
Yeah, and it's also worth saying, um, Lyndon, that you can, um, if you go on any of their social media channels, they're very active. So it may be that even, you could, even, um, even though in the in the lockdown, they're still very active. Yeah, you could ask a ask them a question or send them a message directly, and and um, they'd be able to give you a good explanation as well on that one. Um, Gareth, I actually have a question. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask about um, the landscape um, that kind of you said that the the landscape that the Horton houses were found in was quite a rich um, Neolithic mm -hmm. landscape. Why? What sort of um, kind of features might there have been there? What made it so popular for these communities at that time? Was it the resources or what was what was there that made them settle? Absolutely, that's a really good question, actually. So we're, we're talking the Middle Thames Valley. Um, so we are in a valley bowl with the Thames running through it. So incredibly rich, fertile lands um, and an awful lot of resources. Now, archaeologically, we've got evidence going back tens of thousands of years on these sites. So an, an awful lot of Mesolithic activity. So nomadic groups kind of moving around, using the landscape, using the, the, the Thames, um, and their resources, and then people also being drawn to this area in the Neolithic period to begin settling, to begin, begin their domestication of crops, these these building their enormous monuments. So absolutely, it's the it's the rich fertile lands that is probably the major draw, as well as the the Thames as a resource anyway, and pro probably the Thames for sort of transportation if you like, um, and trade. Um, and we see that kind of going through the various periods as well. In particular, springs to mind is the Middle Thames, uh, sorry, the, in the Middle Bronze Age. Just the, the whole area is just vastly um, subdivided into field systems and um, parcels of land and very intensively farmed. So throughout history, people are drawn to this area. Mm. Yeah, and we definitely see that through the big um, monuments that have been built and kind of littered throughout that. Um, yeah. That landscape yeah um and just to, from that little plug we've um potentially got um one of gareth's uh team that will be doing another talk later down the line um about datchet which is another semex quarry um where we found um some amazing monumental architect um archaeology as well um so yes we'll be promoting that um shortly so that's another one to watch out for if you're interested um so vicky has now asked you a question Mm -hmm. um, did any of the post holes have associated structured deposition or were no. any singled out in any other way? No, uh, ultimately, unfortunately, no, there was no structured deposition in any of them. There was no uh, post pads or anything like that in the bottom of them. They were just fairly simple. They were quite changeable in size, um, mm -hmm. diameter wise, fairly similar, but depth wise kind of very, very different. Um, on in particular Horton 2 but also Horton 1 in particular they were you know they're very very kind of sort of standard if you like not much sort of deposition not much artifactual deposition in the me they just kind of fairly simple and fairly straightforward I mean the thing that stands us the um, Horton 1 and Horton 2 apart from the, the gully construction is the, the size um, the earth fast um, post holes again just kind of fairly kind of fairly standard sort of um sizes um if you like or very regular sizes i should say but with very minimal deposition of finds in them um the 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 house void that i referred to the possible fifth um um that they were definitely expand extend extended and expanded into pits because by the time we excavated them they were very clear um, pit deposition with structured deposits of bone ores being broken and placed into two opposing pits and things like that, an awful lot of pottery. Um, mm. But the house void, we, you know, the shape of it is identical to the size of and footprint of um, Horton 1. Mm. Um, I should say that there's quite a lot of information about Horton um, and the excavations at Horton, particularly on our website. Um, so it's worth looking out for that if you're interested. Mm. And um, so Jack, Jack's also asked this question. Um, mm -hmm. He says, can I ask if there was any consideration of building with turf, as this was touched upon with other the other building that was taken down? 
Uh, Roy Loveday, he thinks, has suggested the idea of turf as a building material, perhaps abutting wattle walls. The problem is that sites he refers to displayed quite faint marks, which he interpreted as possible turfs. And obviously your reconstruction has the roof sloping right down to the ground. But did yeah. you see any suggestion of this at Horton at all or consider using turfs for the roof material? OK, again, that's a really good question. Um, archaeologically, no, there was no evidence of turf. Um, generally, our gully constructions, in particular, were there were at times they were a meter meter depth, but generally they were kind of about um, 20 to 40 centimeters in depth. Um, they were all 100% excavated, and we had no evidence of kind of turf lines or anything like that, or suggestions of turf. Now, I know in the turf, what did definitely come up in the discussions about how we were going to um, uh, on this building, and obviously at Flandigai, they they did have a line of turf. Um, generally, I think the decision made by was made by Butzer to go with the um, the, re the water reed simply because for longevity, it it lasts up to 50 years. They they're wanting to build um, a house that will last kind of 10, 15, 20 years. The previous building, as I'm, I may have mentioned at the start, only lasted about five years, five six years, before it started to collapse and the, the and the the re um, the thatch there was very sort of soggy and, and moldy by the time we got to the end. So there was definitely a consideration of turf, but I think just generally for a more sort of practical um, thing for the for the farm as a kind of a, a teaching aid as an as an sort of an educational tool, the decision was go, to go down the route of reed. Now they have other Neolithic buildings on the site um, based on like the Durrington Walls buildings, for instance, which are falling apart. Now there has been suggestions that when they come down they need to replace it with something. And we're kind of loosely discussed, I won't say absolutely, but we've loosely discussed the, the potential for building a, a second Horton house. Now, that really excites us. I'm quite keen to do like Horton 3, for instance, one of the, the posted constructions with the four deep post holes. And absolutely, there's the chance to do something with that that's completely different to Horton 2 from an experimental point of view. And absolutely, that could include turf. Because I'd be really keen to, to, to go down that route of a turf roof yeah great um okay thank you and um one from helen which is a tricky one to answer just because it's um yeah. quite broad um and also just to make you aware helen um a lot of our sites come with kind of constraints um, particularly because they're for commercial clients so we can't necessarily say too much about them while they're being excavated um it's usually after they're excavated that we can then talk about them to the public so helen just says Hi Gareth, have you found any other sites that could be excavated in the future? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that is quite a question. Ultimately, in the world of commercial archaeology, um, the excavation areas that we go to are defined largely by um, planning boundaries, if you like. So Maddie mentioned before, this might relate to uh, housing developments, it might relate to somebody building a, an extension to their home in a particularly archaeologically rich area so they they have to do some archaeological work there in the case of Horton it was a gravel quarry and in and that quarry uh, the cement quarry had basically picked up when they that quarry finished they moved to Datchet which we've referred to a couple of times and the same process goes for there now the benefit of going to the quarries is and is very similar to the excavations that were, were undertaken at Heathrow Airport for Terminal 5 is that instead of seeing small windows it, which is effectively what we we normally see very small scale excavations the benefit of these quarry sites is that we get to open up large and vast landscapes so we're getting to see a huge amount of information but in context and it's often on and particularly at Horton it was often the the, the blanket areas that almost made more sense and more more important than the very busy archaeological areas if that makes sense so that's kind of one of the the benefits of that but yes absolutely we are kind of defined by the boundary um of of, of where where what's being destroyed effectively um we work on a thing called um preservation by records ultimately which is means that it's going to be destroyed so the archaeological archaeologist um archaeology sorry goes um it's going to be destroyed so the archaeologists go in there record what they can record it in records so absolute sort of scientific um essentially scientific approach recording that and then ultimately that information will be distributed via websites and things and ultimately books in some cases and that's certainly what's happening with with horton there there are two volumes um due out probably next year 
um, spe specifically on the houses. So we can't necessarily guarantee what, that we're going to find anything. Um, obviously, there's other techniques that we use, like geophysical surveys and trial trenching evaluations and things like that to kind of pick out key areas um, for excavation. But certainly the houses um, wouldn't have necessarily come up on geophysical survey. And so things like that, things like these houses, and particularly the posted ones, Horton um, 3 and 4, you would only really find those and doing the kind of excavations we were undertaking at Horton, i.e. the stripping of entire vast landscapes. And like I said, it's 52 hectares that we've looked at at Horton. It's huge, yeah. It's a really lovely opportunity we had at, um, at those quarry sites, definitely. Um, well, thank you very much for all, all of your questions, everybody. Um, I think that that seems like it's it from uh, on the question side from our attendees. So thank you very much. Um, and Gareth, thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, no and again, I'd just like to reiterate um, what Gareth said. If you want to um, find out any uh, any more information uh, look at our website Butts's website and also um, all of our social media channels um, have been kind of telling the story of the build as well um, and there's a lot more information on there as well and a lot more things to hopefully get you through lockdown with a bit more kind of light relief um, about archaeology and what we do so by all means um, take a look on there um, and thank you very much for tuning in <laughs>